This podcast is about eclampsia. I'm Susan Bewley, a consultant in obstetrics at Guy's and St Thomas's in London and have dealt with a lot of preeclampsia and eclampsia. The information in this podcast comes from the postgraduate training in obstetrics and gynaecology book dealing with the curriculum for obstetrics and gynaecology. In this podcast, we'll be looking at the definition of eclampsia, its complications, how it's diagnosed and how it's managed. It's one of the most important obstetrics emergencies and all over the world, women are experiencing eclampsia, which can be fatal. The definition of eclampsia are convulsions superimposed on preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a mysterious disease of pregnancy, but largely characterised by hypertension and proteinuria and complications that can occur in any organ system of the body. The fits are eclampsia. A useful rule of thumb is that any convulsion during pregnancy should be treated as eclampsia. Obviously, epileptics can get pregnant and can have an epileptic fit during pregnancy, but epileptics can also get preeclampsia and eclampsia. It's quite common. Preeclampsia occurs in 2 to 5% of the population, and eclampsia complicates a significant proportion of these, and it's very important because if a woman fits, she can vomit, she can inhale, and she can rarely go into status epilepticus. It's a measure of the severity of preeclampsia. Women who have eclampsia have a higher chance of mortality than those who are delivered before the eclamptic fit occurs. Also, it's very important that when the pregnancy is over, either naturally or because she has been delivered by induction or caesarean section, a woman can still be at risk of eclampsia for the first two days. Half the eclamptic fits, in fact, occur after delivery. And once the baby is born, the mother must still be uh, paid a lot of attention to her because her risk has not gone away. So let's go again through preeclampsia. It is a disease of pregnancy that comes from the placenta. Once the placenta is delivered, the disease goes away after about two days. We don't really understand its basis. It's something immunological and it's seen more commonly in first pregnancies, in older women, in women with arterial disease of one sort or another, in women with twins and in women with large placentas. The cardinal features are hypertension, which is why blood pressure is measured at every single antenatal visit, and proteinuria, which is why urine is tested at every single antenatal visit. Many women get a little bit of high blood pressure at term, as the natural physiology is for blood pressure to fall in the middle of pregnancy and then rise again at the end. So not all blood pressure is preeclampsia, but all blood pressure must be investigated and followed and monitored in case preeclampsia develops. There are some key symptoms of preeclampsia and these also must be followed. Headache, epigastric pain, visual disturbance, lower abdominal pain and swelling, uh, more than merely ankle swelling, but pitting edema that may go above the knees. Once a woman has got a diagnosis of preeclampsia, there are only two things that can be done. She can be delivered or she can be monitored. The reason we continue monitoring, largely as an inpatient, is so that the fetus can gain in gestation and gain maturity. The problem of preeclampsia is that one is always pitting maternal and fetal complications. The earlier the pregnancy is ended, the better for the mother in terms of morbidity and mortality. The longer the pregnancy continues, the better for the baby in terms of morbidity and mortality. So monitoring 
to prevent further complications, of which eclampsia is one, has to be done regularly and in hospital. What are those complications of preeclampsia and eclampsia? Well, the most important ones are the maternal ones. Women can die of preeclampsia, eclampsia, most often through stroke, through uncontrolled hypertension, but also through a status epilepticus and respiratory failure and through inhalation um, and Mendelssohn syndrome. A severe complication of preeclampsia is HELP syndrome. The letters stand for H for hemolysis, EL for elevated liver enzymes, and LP for low platelets. If a woman has HELP syndrome, the mortality is said to be as high as 10%. DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, is associated with preeclampsia, and this is why we look on the film at for fragments for hemolysis and platelets and clotting factors. Acute renal failure can occur, but this is not so usually dangerous and is more usually treatable. In the same way that the mother can get complications in all systems of the body, the disease can present on the placental side in fetal complications. Because preeclampsia is related to the failure of the syncytiotrophoblast implantation in the mid-second trimester, some placentas are hypoxic and that can lead to intrauterine growth restriction on the part of the baby. The baby may be small, may stop passing urine and may have abnormalities in the Dopplers, particularly of the cord and of the brain. When a baby is very sick and near to death, it may show abnormalities on a cardiotocograph or develop a bradycardia. If a woman has a fit and becomes slightly hypoxic, there may be a bradycardia in a baby that has been normal beforehand. And this can make people act very quickly in the fetal interest at a time that is very dangerous for the mother when she is fitting. If a baby is born prematurely, it may suffer from respiratory distress syndrome and or intracranial hemorrhage, another complication of prematurity. In order to avoid the complications of prematurity, we often use steroids to mature the baby's lungs in preparation for an iatrogenic premature delivery. What are the clinical features? The most important things to take note of are headache, very common in pregnancy, but in imminent eclampsia or severe preeclampsia, this will often be occipital, severe and unremitting and not helped by analgesics. The visual disturbance may be flashing lights um, and sometimes just a blurring of vision. The abdominal pain is often central, maybe sometimes a little bit to the in the right upper quadrant because it can be associated with um, infarction or hemorrhage in the liver but often mistaken for heartburn. The most important things on examination are the usual vital observations. They are called vital signs because they are vital. The pulse will often remain normal and but the blood pressure can be very high. A systolic blood pressure over 160 is associated with a higher risk of stroke. Both the systolic and the diastolic pressures are relevant and management is often dealt with on the MAP or the mean arterial pressure. Women who have had a fit, it's very important to look at their oxygen saturations because this may be the only clue that they've um, inhaled uh, something. The respiratory rate is important and the temperature will usually be normal unless a woman has complications of the delivery such as by cesarean. 
Two other important things to focus on are the chest examination, particularly looking for crackles in the bases of the lungs, which may be associated with pulmonary edema or other abnormal features related to inhalation, or after the caesarean, let us say, for um, chest infection. The neurological examination is also very important, in particular looking for brisk reflexes, which may be a sign of imminent eclampsia, uh, and also looking for cerebral edema. If a woman is imminently thought to be going to have a fit, or she has just had a fit, these are the important investigations to do. Arterial blood gases are used when women are unconscious or if they're extremely unwell. The normal venous bloods that are taken are the full blood count, the clotting only if the platelets are low or if there are concerns about bleeding or hemolysis. Use an ESA performed to look for renal involvement and liver function tests are done to look for liver involvement. Glucose is very important as a low glucose may be associated with acute fatty liver, another rare variant of severe preeclampsia. Calcium and magnesium are important, particularly if one is using magnesium sulfate to control or prevent fits. Uric acid is always done in, as an aid to diagnosis. A toxicology screen would be performed if there are concerns that this fit is not an eclamptic fit, i.e. if a woman presents and doesn't have any other features that are suspicious of preeclampsia. A chest x-ray is usually done to look for pulmonary edema, a large heart, sometimes for signs of inhalation and afterwards maybe for infection. A CT or MRI scan will be done particularly if a fit is thought not to be preeclamptic and to look for a space occupying lesion it can be helpful in women who have abnormal neurology after a fit to exclude stroke. Occasionally an EEG will be performed and a CTG, a cardiotocograph, is important for the baby to check the fetal condition. The management of eclampsia. The basic rules of thumb hold for this as of every other obstetric and medical emergency that is, one must always start with the basic resuscitation of ABC. In eclampsia, one must not forget that the maternal condition is the priority, even above that of the baby, and that is because the risk to the mother is so serious. It is important not to deliver an unstable patient until she is sorted. If a woman presents as an emergency, getting her blood pressure under control, understanding the severity of the preeclampsia eclampsia and preparing her for delivery or anaesthetic will take some time and it would be rare to deliver a woman who presents directly through accident and emergency or to the labour ward in under two to four hours. It is possible when a woman is having a fit if a slow fetal heartbeat or a bradycardia is noted to consider the concept of in utero resuscitation. A woman must be laying on her left-hand side with a wedge so as to remove the pressure of the large uterus on the inferior vena cava. If the fit is stopped, usually naturally and occasionally with an antiepileptic, and a woman is given oxygen, in most cases the fetal bradycardia will recover. So, if a woman has a fit, the most important thing to do is to call for help this will be an emergency that requires all members of the team, midwives, doctors and anaesthetists, as well as porters to run and uh, people to scribe. The first thing to pay attention to is the airway and check that the patient is breathing. Lastly, the circulation. And again, this is mother, not necessarily baby. The most important thing for the mother's point of view is to control the hypertension. Very high blood pressure, particularly with the fragile arterial system in preeclampsia, can lead to a stroke. The most dangerous time for this is during the insertion of a ET tube by an anaesthetist because if the reflexes are not obtunded, the blood pressure can go very high. 
Intravenous medication is often used and the preferences are libitalol and nifedipine for short-acting oral uh, agent. Other drugs include hydralazine. Most seizures stop on their own. Magnesium sulfate is the drug of choice in eclampsia, both to stop fits and also to prevent further fits, as has been shown in the International Magpie trial. Once the patient is stable, delivery should be considered. It can be by induction if it is near to term and the cervix is favourable. It is often chosen to be by caesarean section. Obviously, if the woman has preeclampsia and is in hospital, steroids may have been given and that will give the baby a better chance after urgent delivery. Eclampsia is a serious and potentially fatal complication of pregnancy. It's usually preceded by preeclampsia. If preeclampsia is managed well, the fit should be avoided. But in summary, control the blood pressure, stabilise the mother and then consider delivering the baby as the disease will only go away after delivery of the placenta. Thank you for listening.